This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Purple. Here at the Word of the Week Towers, we occasionally run out of ideas. No, really. Our dictionaries are so full of holes generated by randomly throwing darts at its pages that 66% of all words are now spelled with an O. Apparently. The various creature catalogs, monster manuals, and basic bestiaries we own are so dog-eared that we take them for walkies every few hours just to prevent accidents. Things have occasionally become so desperate that we even turn to actual listeners on the show's Discord server to turn up ideas. And that's a mistake. Because more often than not, what ends up happening is that two or three people will throw out random words without really considering whether there's anything behind them to work with. It's all well and good to suggest we tackle creatures like the rock or historical developments like the moldboard plow, but what are we supposed to do with words like Aleph, which is really just the first letter of the Semitic alphabet? Unless they meant the 80s disco band. Or the super-capacity cyber hard drive Aleph from William Gibson's final entry into the Neuromancer trilogy. It's hard to tell when everyone just splashes out one word and then walks away. Which is why, when friend of the show O Dog 1970 tromped in and said purple, we immediately wrote it off as some sort of typing based seizure and recommended he see a doctor. And then we stopped teasing him about his age for a moment and recalled that we had often heard it said that nothing rhymes with purple. Immediately we asked ourselves, is that even true? In all the English language, comprised of words stolen willy-nilly from practically any place that hadn't nailed them down, was there really nothing that rhymed with purple? And so here we are. Purple is, as we are sure most of you know, a color. Simple enough. Or it would be if we didn't have to specify that purple is distinct from violet. Violet is what is known as a spectral color, meaning that it appears on the visible spectrum of light, like in a rainbow. It just hangs out there on the opposite side from red. Purple, on the other hand, is not a spectral color. It can only be obtained by mixing equal parts red and blue, making it a secondary color. Unless, of course, you're talking about pigments instead of light. On a color wheel, violet and purple are generally both between red and blue. Purple is closer to red, Violet is closer to blue and not as saturated. And don't even get us started on crimson, which sits between both violet and purple. The word purple itself comes to us through Old English purple and Latin purpura from the Greek word pophyra. The Greeks may have used this word because located off their shores were beds of shallow, cold water loving seaweed known by the same name. Porphyra seaweed is notable for three things. The first, certain species of porphyra, exhibit a strong purple color. It's easy enough to picture two Greeks walking along the shoreline. One would turn to the other to ask what that red-blue color is on that seaweed. The other, being a smart-alecky sort of Greek, would say, It's porphyra color, obviously. Duh. Second, porphyra goes by another name. You've probably run across it before if you've eaten any amount of sushi. In Japan, it is called nori, and in Korea, gim. Nori is the shredded and dried sheets of seaweed used to wrap sushi and other edible products in Japan. Its use dates back to at least the 8th century in a paste form. It wasn't until the mid-1700s of the Edo period that the Japanese decided it was much nicer in dried sheet form and invented a process much like paper making in order to produce it that way. Even so, for such a staple part of their diet, the Japanese didn't really understand how nori grew and was cultivated. After World War II, they had tremendous difficulty growing it at a time when food was at a premium for the Japanese people and they needed all they could get. Thankfully, Japanese scientists found the work of phycologist Kathleen Mary Drew Baker, who had been working with the seaweed off the coast of Wales, where they also grew it for food. Using her research, it quickly recovered the industry. So important and crucial was nori that Baker was hailed as the savior of the Japanese nori industry. She was called Mother of the Sea, and a statue was erected in her honor by the Japanese people. 
one of the reasons nori was so important to Japan, and the third thing on our list of three notable things about porphyra, is that it is an easy source of some essential vitamins. Being mostly composed of water, and just 11% of things that are not water, porphyra provides a significant portion of the vitamins A and C, riboflavin, and folate, as well as smaller amounts of niacin, iron, and zinc. Most important of all, though, porphyra contains high amounts of iodine. If you took high school chemistry, you'll recognize iodine as the heaviest of the stable halogens. It's atomic number 53 and has the letter I as its atomic symbol. Under normal conditions, it's a purple-black solid that becomes a violet liquid and then gas when heated. In 1811, French chemist Bernard Courtois, who was looking to make more saltpeter because the Napoleonic Wars were still in full swing and people were running out of the stuff because of all the shooting going on, Courtois discovered that one of the key ingredients in saltpeter, sodium carbonate, could be found in, you guessed it, seaweed. Basically, you get a lot of seaweed together and burn it. The ash it leaves behind contains all the sodium carbonate you could want, but also a lot of other stuff you don't want. So, rather than leaving the remaining ash around to pile up, you douse it in sulfuric acid, which would destroy all the leftover junk. Unless, of course, you added too much sulfuric acid, in which case the excess would make this neat purple vapor rise out of the stuff you were trying to get rid of. If you allowed it to condense against a cold plate, you got little purple-black crystals. Well, Bernard didn't know what that was all about. It was neat, sure, and he was pretty certain he'd stumbled onto something new. But because of the aforementioned lack of saltpeter, he didn't have a lot of time to investigate it. So instead, he handed out samples of this new material to all his friends and acquaintances like it was some sort of party favor, and told them to go ahead and have a look at it. Eventually, they worked out they had a new element to add to the periodic table, and called it iodi, the Greek word for violet, after the color of the gas it gave off. One of the people Courtois gave a sample to was a guy named Nicholas Clement. Not familiar? Well, he should be. Part of Clement's research into iodine, particularly the compound silver iodide, paved the way for the development of photography. And... If you want to look good in a photograph, you have to know about the other thing Nicholas Clement did. He's famous for counting. And what he counted was calories. Counting calories is often used as a means to better health. If you watch the calories you take in and make sure you burn more calories than that amount exercising, losing weight is practically guaranteed. Except that sometimes, Losing weight is particularly difficult for some people, especially those who suffer from hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is a dysfunction of the thyroid gland, which causes it to stop producing enough of the hormones needed to regulate the body's metabolism. Symptoms can include tiredness, constipation, depression, and significant weight gain, as well as the occurrence of goiters. During the 1800s and into the early 1900s in the United States, there was practically an epidemic of hypothyroidism. Particularly badly hit were the Appalachian, Great Lakes, and northwestern regions of the United States. In fact, it was so bad that 26% to 70% of children in those regions had clinically apparent goiters, and it earned those places the name the goiter belt. And what's a goiter? Well, a goiter occurs when the thyroid gland, located in your neck, begins to swell. When that swelling gets large enough, it becomes visible as a large lump or sac at the base of the neck and continues to swell until treated. Some get as large as baseballs. Others achieve basketball size. And the reported largest goiter ever recorded was removed from a 60-year-old woman in India in 2015 and weighed over 6 pounds. During the draft for World War I, one Michigan doctor reported that of 583 draftees, fully 30% had significant goiters that disqualified them from service. And in parts of Michigan in the following year, that percentage climbed to 64%. The worst part is, most of it was entirely preventable. Scientists, doctors, and other health officials had known since the 1830s what the cause was iodine deficiency. 
tests showed that in people who had goiters and other signs of hypothyroidism, a dosage of iodine produced immediate improvement. And it didn't even have to be that big a dosage. As little as 150 micrograms of iodine a day was sufficient to prevent it. Which is why, since 1924, the rate of hypothyroidism due to iodine deficiency in the United States has dropped to almost nothing. That's the year Morton Salt started selling iodized salt, that is, salt with iodine added to it, commercially, in the U.S. Not only did goiters virtually disappear, people got smarter, too. The introduction of iodized salt coincides with an increase in IQ, a 2013 study found a gradual increase since 1924 in average intelligence of one standard deviation. That's 15 points in iodine-deficient areas and 3.5 points nationally. But we digress. Here's one other thing we know about purple, and we bet you know it too. Purple is the color of royalty. Only kings were allowed to wear purple, and so that's how you'd know who was king. He was the guy dressed in purple, because only kings could afford it. Well, the real story turns out to be a little bit of yes, but also a lot of no. But to understand the whys and wherefores, you have to go way, way back in history. It wasn't that purple was particularly rare in general. It was that a particular kind of purple was rare. See, you could always go out into the fields and find purple flowers and rub them against various things to transfer the purple colors to a new item. And certain bugs would produce a kind of purple dye as well when squashed. But these tinting and dyeing efforts never really lasted. The color would fade the more it was exposed to sunlight, and it was really hard to get the dye to even work on animal-based fabrics like wool and silk. It just didn't seem to take at all well. Then, in the ancient Phoenician city of Tyre, Someone killed a snail, and a tiny bit of purple came out of it. And whomever that was immediately became immensely rich. At least, we presume that's how it happened, because it was about 1570 BCE when the first instance of what is called Tyrian purple first showed up, and no one really thought to write down how it all happened. And Tyrian purple is the good stuff, the stuff you really want to have, because it does two things that no other purple dye could do. First, it didn't fade, it was color fast. And not only did it not fade, it actually got brighter and more vibrant the more it was exposed to sunlight. Where other purples became washed out and faded until they looked mostly off gray, Tyrian purple just kept getting richer and richer. Second, it was easy to get it to work on wool and silk. Now you could dye anything you wanted in this deep, rich purple. Capes, togas, shoes, cushions, curtains, rugs, anything made of any fabric would take the color and keep it. All you had to do was collect enough of the stuff and treat it properly. Which was the real problem. See, this snail we mentioned was a poisonous sea snail, one of several, each producing a slightly different shade of purple, all from the family Myricidae, originally Murex. And they weren't very big, and the part you wanted out of them to make the dye was even tinier. 12,000 snails, it was said, would only produce enough dye to barely color the trim of a garment at best. In fact, some reports say it took upwards of 200,000 thousand snails to produce one ounce of dye. Furthermore, in order to get the dye you needed, you either had to crack open each snail and carefully remove some mucus in a very tiny gland, which you then squeezed until its contents came out, or you had to very carefully milk, by poking, a poisonous snail until it gave up the mucus and secretions on its own. You would then expose the collected squeezings to the sun, for a very precise amount of time to get the right shade, then render it all down over a lengthy boiling process. So, not only did it take a lot of snails, it was both labor and time intensive. And that made it rare. And rare made it expensive. But Tyr knew when it had a good thing, and for centuries they sat on the secret of making Tyrian dye 
and told no one. No one at all. Which meant they cornered the entire market for purple dye and could gosh darn well charge whatever they liked to make up for all the effort it took to actually make this stuff. Some say that Tyrian dye became worth its weight in gold. Others say it was more expensive than even that. Practically as soon as it was available, Tyrian purple became a status symbol of wealth and power. It wasn't long before laws were passed to control access to the dye. Called sumptuary laws, they meant that only the rich and the royal could wear to use it. Except, even that isn't correct. Sumptuary laws weren't only about, or even mostly about, making sure the rich and powerful were the only ones to have access to the good stuff. They're very much more complicated than that. Many sumptuary laws were designed to regulate the demand for imported or rare goods. A sudden demand for Gadget X might mean that the associated tariffs, fees, and taxes could bankrupt the state, so laws were put in place to limit the number of Gadget Xs in circulation. Laws were enacted against the aristocracy as well as the common people, especially in places where the aristocracy was known to chase the latest fad or trend. Enacting some laws meant that conspicuous consumption was limited, thereby ensuring that no one person could buy up all the Sony switch boxes and making sure there would be some for all. And yes, in some instances, sumptuary laws did restrict access to clothes and dyes and reserve them for the upper class only. Largely, though, this was intended to make sure the aristocracy could be told apart from the rest of the populace. In places and times when most citizens didn't know what the ruling class personally looked like, knowing that anyone in purple was nominally in charge was akin to different military ranks all being marked by different numbers and styles of stripes. It saved embarrassment, or worse. In the twelfth book of Diodorus of Sicily, a historian from the first century BCE, he records the following sumptuary laws as given by Zeleucus, a Greek lawmaker from the 7th century BCE. The Lorican Code, of which the following is just a part, is recorded as the first written Greek law code. To cite examples, whereas everywhere else wayward wives were required to pay fines, Zeleucus stopped their licentious behavior by a cunningly devised punishment. That is, he made the following laws. A freeborn woman may not be accompanied by more than one female slave, unless she is drunk. She may not leave this city during the night, unless she is planning to commit adultery. She may not wear gold jewelry or a garment with a purple border, unless she is a courtesan. And a husband may not wear a gold studded ring or a cloak of Milesian fashion, unless he is bent upon prostitution or adultery. As you can tell, Seleucus was no fool. Any woman wearing purple would automatically be thought to be a courtesan, since this was the only way she would be allowed to wear it openly. So yes, sumptuary laws were used to restrict the use of purple, but also for a variety of other reasons. Even so, by the 4th century, only the Roman emperor was allowed to wear purple. By the 9th century, the phrase born to the purple came to mean a child born of royal blood, as opposed to one born to a conquering king or usurper. But while Tyrian purple would last and last, the exclusivity of it would not, nor would the Roman Empire. As power moved to the Byzantine Empire, purple was still a royal color, but a change was taking place. Bishops in the Byzantine churches began wearing purple stripes on their robes, and Bibles with gold lettering were printed on purple paper. Government officials, in order to mark their rank within the system, would also wear squares of purple cloth on their clothing. But in 1453, it all came crashing down. The Ottoman Turks took Constantinople, and purple lost its status. Scarlet from the cochineal insect became the hot new royal color in Europe. Even the Pope gave up on Tyrian purple just a few years later. Pope Paul II sent out word that cardinals should switch to scarlet, and that really seemed to be the end of Tyrian purple as a status symbol. Except there was this sort of new thing going on in Europe. Suddenly everyone started sprouting universities all over the place, and the professors at these universities began adopting purple as the new color of their robes. They were emulating the clergy 
and you can draw your own conclusions about what they thought that said about the new university system of education. In particular, students of divinity wore full purple robes. In the 15th and 16th century, Renaissance artists started using purple in their art. Many paintings of saints and other religious figures from this period featured them wearing clothing colored various shades of purple. But by the mid-19th century, all bets were off. In 1856, a chemistry student named William Henry Perkin, while trying to do something totally other, accidentally invented a synthetic purple. Well, technically he invented synthetic mauve. But that was close enough, and it became all the rage in Europe. At the Royal Exhibition of 1862, Queen Victoria wore a silk dress dyed mauve, and that was the go signal for every fashionable person everywhere to start turning out in a new color. Perkin, no slouch, refined the process and quickly built factories to produce the dye. Because who doesn't like raking cash in hand over fist? Pretty soon, everyone had access to mauve and could wear it whenever they liked. Not long after that, synthetic true purples became available, and even we, humble hosts that we are, have access to shirts and sheets and curtains in formerly royal colors. But what, we remind ourselves, about our original question? Is it true? that nothing rhymes with purple, does no other word contain that tantalizing mix of syllables? Well, by way of answer, we offer you the following. A small composition of our own design. There once was a man all in purple, who walked with a bit of a herple. He fell off his horse and made matters worse by forgetting to secure its kerple a limerick, and it wasn't even a bit purple. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>